in the previous video, we talked about how deep learning systems like PyTorch and TensorFlow allow us to build up a computation graph in code. Once we have this computation graph, we can then use it to implement backpropagation. To do this efficiently on computation graphs that contain tensors, we will assume these three basic rules. Functions can have any number of inputs and outputs. Inputs and outputs can be tensors of any rank. And crucially, the final output must be a scalar. That is, we always take the derivative of a scalar function. It can have multiple inputs, all of which can be tensors, but it can have only one output, which is a scalar. Note that this doesn't mean we can only ever train neural networks with a single scalar output, because that would be quite boring. Even the multi-class classification model from the previous lecture already had three outputs, and later we want to start building neural networks that can generate faces or play chess. All of that is fine. Our model can have any number of outputs of any shape and size. However, the loss we define over those outputs needs to map them all to a single scalar value. The computation graph is always the model plus the computation of the loss. This way, no matter how complex our model becomes, the computation we're using for backpropagation is always one that has a single scalar output, namely the loss. In order to make backpropagation flexible and robust enough to work in this setting, we need to discuss two features that we haven't mentioned yet. How to perform backpropagation if the result depends on the dependent variable along different computation paths, and how to take derivatives when the variables aren't scalars. So far, we've only looked at applying the chain rule to computation graphs that look like paths, a single sequence of functions with the output of the last being the input to the next. If a function has multiple inputs, there isn't usually a problem applying the chain rule. If we want the derivative with respect to x, we apply the chain rule over the path. We apply the chain rule over the path from x to c. For this derivative, b is a constant, so we can ignore the path over b in the computation graph. If we want the derivative with respect to y, we apply the chain rule along the other path, taking a as a constant and ignoring it. This is what we did in the last lecture when we applied backpropagation to the feedforward network. The problem happens if c has multiple inputs, both depending on x. How do we apply the chain rule? Do we apply it over a, saying that the derivative of c with respect to x is that of c over a times that of a over x? Or do we apply it over b, saying that the derivative of c over x is that of c over b times that of b over x. For such cases, we need the multivariate chain rule. It's very simple. To work out the derivative of a function with multiple inputs, we just take a single derivative for each input, treating the others as constants, and we sum them. So the answer to the question in the last slide is that we do both and sum the results. The multivariate chain rule can be used to derive many rules for derivatives you should already know. For instance, if we make c the product of a and b, applying the multivariate chain rule looks like this. The derivative of c with respect to x, by filling in c, we see is the derivative of a times b with respect to x. We apply the multivariate chain rule, which gives us two paths over the computation graph, one through a and one through b. The path through a tells us that this derivative is the derivative of a times b over a times that of a over x, and here we treat b as a constant, plus the derivative of a times b over b times that of b over x, treating a as a constant. In the first term, the factor on the left results in b, and in the second term, the factor on the left results in a, which leads to the product rule for taking derivatives. If c has more than two inputs, the multivariate chain rule tells us to sum over all of them. With that, we know how to apply the chain rule to any kind of computation graph. Next, we need to figure out how to make backpropagation work in settings where our inputs and outputs are tensors. The first step of applying backpropagation is to break our computation into modules. For our feedforward network, this is a natural way to draw the computation graph in terms of matrices and vectors. Note that both the models and inputs are now nodes in the computation graph, and all these nodes contain tensors. 
With this computation graph, these are the computations defining the outputs of our modules. And the gradients that we are interested in are the gradients of the output L with respect to our parameters V, C, W, and B. In the previous slide, we took these derivatives and we applied the chain rule to break them up into a long product over all the local derivatives for each of these modules. So the question is, can we do that again? We would like to have a chain rule, like the one shown on the right, and then to work out how to compute these local derivatives efficiently. Does this exist? What would it mean to take the derivative of a vector with respect to a matrix? And there are ways to define the derivative of a function with respect to a matrix or a vector. In general, if we have a function with a tensor input and a tensor output, we can take a large number of scalar derivatives by taking the derivative of one of its outputs with respect to one of its inputs. The gradient is an example of this. We have a function from a vector to a scalar, so we take all scalar derivatives of the output with respect to one of the inputs, and then we collect all these derivatives into a vector, and that's called the gradient. If we have a function that works the other way around, that takes a scalar and produces a vector, we can collect all derivatives of one output with respect to the single input. This can also be neatly represented in a vector. If we have a vector-to-vector -vector function, we can take all scalar derivatives of one of the m outputs with respect to one of the n inputs. This is best represented in an n by m matrix. If we go higher, like a matrix to vector function, we get so many derivatives that we need a three tensor to properly represent them. And this is where we run into trouble, because for our local derivatives, we need multiplication to be defined. For matrices and vectors, Multiplication is defined and it works similarly to scalar multiplication. That means that so long as our local derivatives are only matrices or vectors, we can still hope for a functional chain rule where we can work out the local derivatives, compute them and multiply them together, either by vector multiplication or by matrix multiplication. This breaks down if any of these are three tensors. For instance, in the last factor here, we have the derivative of a vector over a matrix, so the best way to represent all the scalar derivatives that make up this local derivative is in a three tensor, which we cannot hope to multiply into our global gradient. Our saving grace is the fact that we assume that our function as a whole always has a scalar output. This means that whatever we are doing, the only derivatives that we ever want to end up with are those of the loss with respect to some tensor in our computation graph. This means that for the derivatives we want to end up with, we are always in the leftmost column of this matrix. And this allows us to define the gradients we're interested in, in a fairly straightforward way. We will call the gradient of the loss with respect to some part of our computation graph, W, the gradient of L with respect to W, or the gradient for W. This is commonly written as nabla underscore WL, and we will make the non-standard assumption that the gradient for W has the same shape as W. So for instance, if W is a three tensor, so for instance, if W is a three tensor that can be indexed by three indices i, j, and k, then the gradient for W is also a three tensor. An element i, j, k in that tensor is simply the derivative of the loss with respect to that element of the tensor. With these rules, we can use tensors of any shape and dimension, and we always have a well-defined gradient. Note that in other fields, the gradient often has a different shape from the thing we're taking the gradient for. If the function takes column vectors, the gradient is defined as a row vector. That's because in these fields, the gradient is used as an operator, defining a function on the original vector space. In our case, we are not interested in using the gradients in this way. It is only ever used to define a direction in our model space, which will help us search, so for us, it makes more sense to have the gradient be the same shape and size as the tensor for which we're computing the gradient. This notation is a little cumbersome because the argument of the gradient here will always be the same. We're only ever interested in the gradient of the loss, so this L will never change. And the thing that we're actually interested in, and the thing that we're actually interested in, 
and that tells us the shape of the tensor that is represented here is relegated to a subscript. So instead, we will write the gradient for a matrix A like this, using a superscript number. And this can be applied for vectors, matrices, and tensors. So to summarize, a superscript nabla is a matrix of the same shape and size as A, such that element ij of that matrix is the derivative of the loss with respect to element ij of A. With these principles in place, we can now apply backpropagation in a tensor-friendly way. Instead of computing the local derivatives first and then multiplying to compute the global derivatives, we accumulate the product of the local derivatives directly. As an example, here's how we implement the first layer of our feedforward network as a function. It has three inputs, w, x, and b, and one output. The forward function computes the unactivated values of the first layer, k, given the inputs x, weights w, and bias b. And we do this simply by multiplying w by x and adding b. The backward function is given the derivative of the loss for k, and should output the derivatives of the loss for w, x, and b. And we'll look at how to compute the first one as an example. Here's the plan in general for working out what such a backward function should return. We first describe the problem in terms of scalar derivatives. We apply the scalar multivariate chain rule. And then we look at what we found and rewrite these computations as tensor operations. So here we go. We have the function that computes k. And let's say we're interested in the derivative of the loss with respect to one of the elements of w. This is a scalar derivative, so we can work it out using all the rules we already know. The loss is a function of k, and k contains multiple elements. So we can summarize the computation graph like this. w23, which we're computing the derivative for, is used to compute several values k1 to k3, and these are then used to compute the loss. If we look at this, we can see that we can apply the multivariate chain rule, which tells us to take the derivative over each path separately, and then sum up all the results, which we see here in the top right corner. The derivative of L over Ki is what our backward function gets as an argument. So we won't work that out. But the factor on the right, the derivative of Ki over W32, we can work out by filling in the definition of Ki from the forward computation. We fill in the definition of Ki, where K is a vector, which is the result of this matrix operation Wx plus b, and Ki is then the ith element of that vector. We can take the index i inside the brackets by noting that the ith element of k is the ith element of b plus the dot product of x with the ith row of w. We can remove the bi term since it's a constant for this derivative and we can rewrite this dot product as a sum over scalars. That is the dot product of the ith row and x is the product of elements w, i, j, and x, j, summed over j. We can work the sum out of the derivative so that it becomes a nested sum together with the sum over i, j. And now we see that we have a term that is non-zero only when i is equal to 3 and j is equal to 2. Unless that is the case, w3, 2, which we're taking the derivative for, doesn't occur in the expression we're taking the derivative of, so for those terms it disappears, and we are only left with the single term where i is equal to 3 and j is equal to 2. Which means we can remove the sum symbol, replace all i's with 3 and all j's with 2, which gives us this. And solving the derivative in the second factor, we see that the scalar derivative of the loss over element 3, 2 is the derivative for element k3 times x2. Now we don't actually want to compute the scalar derivatives one by one like this, but at least now we know what's expected of us. We can write down what all the elements of the gradient 4w look like, and see if we can find some clever way to figure out how to compute this matrix using simple linear algebra operations, instead of filling the elements of the matrix in one by one. This is called vectorizing.
expressing an algorithm in single matrix operations rather than in a series of loops. So what we've learned is that this derivative that we're interested in, which is the element 3, 2 in our gradient matrix for W, can be expressed as the derivative of the loss with respect to K3 times X2, which is equal to the third element of the gradient for K, which we are given, times the second element of X. If we look at the gradient for W, which we are supposed to compute, and fill in what all its elements look like, we can notice that in terms of the vectors k nabla and x, this is an outer product. If we take this vector k nabla that we are given in our backward function and multiply it by the transpose of x, the result is this matrix that we're interested in. So with that, by first working out what the scalar value is that we're interested in, looking at the matrix of all scalar values, we can figure out which matrix operation gives us the complete gradient. So now back to the backward function that we were supposed to implement. We are given the gradients for k, and we want to compute the gradients for w, x, and b. And we've now figured out that the gradient for w can be computed as the outer product of the vector k that we're given and the vector x. If you follow the same, der if you follow the same kind of derivation, you'll see that the gradient for x is given by the transpose of w times the gradient for k, and the gradient for b is simply equal to the gradient for k. If we do this for all our functions, we can go back to our computation graph. We can start at the top and work our way downwards. The gradient on the loss is always 1, the derivative of the loss with respect to itself. And once we know the gradient for the loss, we can apply the backward function of the function that computed the loss. This will give us the gradient for y and the gradient for t. Once we have the gradient for y, we can apply the backward for the function that computed y. This will give us the gradient for h, the gradient for v, and the gradient for c. Once we have the gradient for h, we can apply the backward of the function that computed h to give us the gradient for k. And once we have the gradient for k, we can apply the backward of the function that computed k to give us the gradient for x, for w, and for b. And in that way, starting at the loss, we move down the computation graph to compute all the gradients for all the intermediate values. So to summarize, in a deep learning framework, we define our model as the application of functions to tensors. We require that each function defines a backward function. This function is given the gradients over the outputs and computes the gradients over the inputs. And with that, we can walk backwards through the graph, accumulating the gradient product. Working out a backward function like this is a bit complicated, and luckily it's usually not necessary. Deep learning frameworks provide a large number of pre-built functions that you can chain together to do almost anything. Only when you write your own function do you need to implement the backward and forward functions. If you do need to work out a backward function, remember, phrase the problem in terms of scalar derivatives, work out the derivative of the loss over one element of the input, use the multivariate chain rule to sum out all the elements of the output variable, and then work out a general solution in terms of matrix operations. In addition to functions, most deep learning frameworks also have a way of combining model parameters and computations into a single unit, often called a module or layer. In this case, a linear model, as it's called in PyTorch, takes care of implementing the computation of a single layer of a feedforward network without the activation and remembering the weights and the bias. These modules combine existing functions together with tensors, and implementing a module is easy. You only define the forward part of the computation in terms of existing functions. The backward is done automatically, because everything is defined in terms of functions that already have backward implemented. And with that, we have all the ingredients we need to implement backpropagation on any computation graph that operates on tensors. If you'd like to see what this looks like in practice, you can click this link to see a very minimal implementation of such a deep learning system in about 300 lines of code. If you'd like to get your hands dirty and start training neural networks yourself, then check out the fourth worksheet to try Keras or the fifth worksheet to try PyTorch. In the next video, we will see what we can build in systems like this besides simple feedforward networks. Specifically, 
we'll look at convolutional neural networks.